uh, Minister Vivian Anderson did a marvelous job reading this compilation of scriptures that come to us from Acts 1 and Acts 2. And so since she has read so thoroughly the contextual environment from whence I will seek to preach today, would you just join me in Acts chapter 2 and we'll look at verses 1 and 2. Acts chapter 2, well, we'll go through to verse 4. Acts chapter 2, and we'll read 1 through 4. When you're there, say, I am there. Would you read aloud with your pastor? Online in the room, online, you read aloud with me. Let's read together. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one of the tongues sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Rain, rain, Jesus, rain. Everyone say rain, rain, Jesus. Would you make it your prayer for the preaching? Say rain. Come on, who is he? He is king. king of and he is Judas Lion Rain. Come on, say it. Come on, all over the sanctuary and everyone online from the top. Rain. Don't you want him to do that in your life? This week, as you go about the living of your life, amid all the circuitous circumstances, would you reign? My, my. Come on, church, say with me. His name. And he is Judah's life. Come on, clap your hands as you go to your seats. Hallelujah. This morning, beloved, we continue this series that we began some weeks ago, and um, we've been involved and engaged in it now throughout the month of May, entitled The Power of One. And so far, my Mary, in this series, we have looked first at what we called the power lee of one desire. Uh, we listen to David, that sweet psalmist of Israel, that king anointed and appointed, taken from the sheepfold to the palace. As David says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that is what I will seek after. Then we saw this Syrophoenician woman, uh, this African mother who had one determination, and that was to see her child healed and delivered. One desire, one Deacon Rod's determination. And today, Deacon Skelton, on this Pentecost Sunday, I want to lift, I want us to look at what I'm calling the one difference. I am convinced, I, I am convinced beyond the shadow of any doubt, without any fear of successful contradiction, that I do not stand in any way under threat of violation of the truth when I say that the coming of the Holy Spirit 
is one of the most seminal events in the life of the church. In fact, I would argue today that the coming of the Holy Spirit, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the falling of the Holy Spirit is the one thing that makes the difference in the life of the believer like nothing else can make a difference. Now, you and I, I know some of y'all are saying, now, wait a minute, Pastor, uh, what about the birth of Jesus? What about the crucifixion? What about the burial? What about the resurrection? What about the ascension of our Lord? And all of those are seminal, and all of those are powerful, and all of those are meaningful, but none of them carry the weight in your life and mine that the coming of the Holy Spirit does. Here's why. Because those are events that happen outside of us. The Holy Spirit happens inside of us. The coming of the Holy Spirit the giving of the Holy Spirit, the imparting and the imputing of the Holy Spirit is one of the greatest, most seminal, most significant events in the history of the world. Now, it's important before I go further, and I need to teach this, Uncle George, because there's so much lack of clarity about the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to understand that the day of Pentecost is not the beginning of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you'll let me, I'll argue my case here and plead it before the bar of justice known as First Church. The Holy Spirit falling on the day of Pentecost is not the origin of the Holy Spirit. No more than is the birth of Jesus in the manger of Bethlehem, the origin of Jesus. Jesus has always existed. John tells us in his prologue, in the beginning was the word, the Logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus has always existed. And in like manner, the Holy Spirit has always existed. We are told that in the morning of creation, when God stood out in the middle of nowhere on the platform of nothing and spoke worlds into existence, he was not there by himself. Can I argue today? Here, here it is. You know the Bible. I just quoted to you the prologue of John. In the beginning was the Word. Word was with God, the Logos. And everything that was made was made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That is the pre-existent, eternal Christ. But Genesis 1 and 1, are y'all still with me? Says in the beginning. Sounds just like John, does it not? In the beginning, God, Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Here it is. And the Spirit of God. Y'all ain't ready for me. I brought a bazooka, you brought a pea shooter. No. In the beginning, God, Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai, stood in the middle of nowhere on the platform of absolutely nothing, stepped into chaos and created cosmos and did it. I feel preach on me today and did it with nothing but the sheer weight, power, and authority of his word. He spoke it, he said it, and it came to pass. Stars started twinkling, flowers started blooming, cows started mooing, pigs started oinking, <laughs> birds started chirping, 
sun started shining. The moon gave its pale light to the darkness of the evening. All because God said, let there be. This omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, omnipotent, all power. This God said, let there be, and there was, in the midst of the darkness of cosmic chaos and the spirit hovered over the face of the deep. Y'all missed it. God, the Father, the Creator is there. How do I know? Ask me how I know. Because the Bible says so. Because as part of the crowning creation process, God, after making everything that is, then says, let us make man in our image after our likeness how much time do y'all have today because i've got more message than you got time let us make man adam man let us make man now I will get in trouble, but it will, I promise you, not be my first or last time getting in trouble. That term man, brothers, don't get too happy, does not only refer to gender specificity. There is no doubt, there is no doubt that God made Adam first. <laughs> he makes a man, a male. <laughs> Might pray. He makes a man, a male. <laughs> and and then do you do you sense Lindy how I'm struggling up here, biting my tongue? <laughs> And, and, Tony, and Tony and Helen, he, he watches Adam hanging with the animals like Dr. Doolittle, if I could talk to the animals. He, he's hanging with these, Lottie, he's kicking it with the animals, but there's not a suitable help me or partner for him. Huh. And Jimmy O, Jimmy O, the first, do y'all have time for me to preach? Because you know I wasn't here last week, so I got to make up for lost time. I got to preach two sermons in one week. Somebody said, oh God, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> if I wanted to, I couldn't do it. He, he looks at Adam. First negative word ever uttered in creation God looks at Adam the man, the male and God says first negative word ever uttered in creation God, okay you don't believe it here's why, here's why, here's why every time, you don't believe me go open your Bible and look at just everything God made it says and God said that's good For five days, everything he makes in creation, what we call nature. And let me just say this, Aunt Trish, Sister Kelly, while I'm on a roll, just call me butter because I'm on a roll. Um, I know y'all like to talk about mother nature. There is no mother nature. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. No, everything you see came to you courtesy of God. God looks at creation, says, that's good, that's good. For five days, God said, that's good. And somewhere around the fifth day in the evening, he looks at Adam running around there with these animals, and every animal obviously has a, a counterpart, a male and female counterpart, except Adam. And, and God says, it is not good for man to be alone. 
And so he, he performs the first surgery. He, he, he applies anesthesia, puts, puts Adam to sleep, opens him up, takes the rib out his side, and fashions and molds woe man. Whoa. Whoa, man. You'll get the interpretation later. Whoa, man. <laughs> let us make man a dom, but let us make human beings, really. That's what I was getting to in our image after our likeness. Here's why I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit's always existed. Because God is tripartite. Father, Son, Spirit. You and I are tripartite, body, soul, and spirit. We get that because we are made in the imago Dei, the image and the likeness of the divine. I need my folk online to help me preach because they're not helping me up in here. No, no, you and I are stamped with the imago Dei, the image of the divine, and present is the word, John 1, oh, y'all missed it. Present is the word, which is why John could say, and see, that's why you got to read the Bible, because John could almost echo Genesis 1, in the beginning, in the beginning. God created. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him, the word was not anything made, are y'all still awake? Because y'all shouted when I said he made it with nothing but the sheer authority of his word. So you have God, and then you have the word, Jesus, who is the word made flesh, and you have the spirit hovering over the face of the deep. All in Genesis 1. So the Holy Spirit showing up on Pentecost is not the beginning of the Holy Spirit. So, so you're probably sitting there now because you are the most brilliant church I know. Y'all online too, Sister Veronica Hill. Y'all too. Y'all are the most brilliant church I know. So I know what you're doing. You're sitting there critiquing my sermon, raising critical questions. You're saying, well, if that's true, What's the big deal about Pentecost? Why you got us dressed up in this white and red? Why are we observing Pentecost if the Holy Ghost, the Parakletos, has always existed? What's the big deal? Great question, and I got a great answer. Because after creation, the Holy Spirit, y'all got time for this? If, 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 if I ever start boring, you put up your Pentecostal finger and let me know and I'll, I'll acknowledge it. <laughs> I'm not going to stop, but I will acknowledge you put it up. <laughs> watch this, watch this. After his activity in creation, Spirit of God. <laughs> hovers. I'm out of breath, y'all. I can't do it again. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> that right there. Hovers. For the remainder from Genesis to Malachi, the Holy Spirit is confined. Y'all write this down. I'm teaching you better than you know. He is confined, Kevin, to times and task. He shows up at certain times for certain tasks, for a certain purpose, for a certain period, over certain persons. Oh, somebody said, this is good, this is good, this is good. That, that, that after he hovers over the deep and God steps into the abyss of chaos and creates cosmos 
word, spirit, father, all at work. He is now relegated to task and times, showing up at certain periods for certain purposes in certain places on certain people. But on Pentecost, <laughs> he is not temporarily here for tasks and times. He is poured out without measure. God, I want to shout, Brother Lee. I want to shout right there. I want to see you don't know where to shout. That, that before, before he would come on the prophets, he would come on the kings, he would come on certain people, and they would have him, and, and he would use them, he would imbibe them and imbue them and impart in them, and they would function and flow under the under the authority and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But then he'd lift. Task assignment fulfilled for that time. But on Pentecost, woo, on, I'm sorry, I'm excited. Deacon Rosie, thank you for standing. On Pentecost, he does not come for task or time, for place and period and for person, but he is poured out without measure. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. God, I thank you. Not just the king, not just the priest, not just the prophet, but every believer. And he doesn't come for just a little while. He comes to stay. Jesus says in John, I will pray the Father. He will send you another comforter. Are y'all ready? He will not just be with you. He will be Old school. Everybody say old school. The comforter has come. The comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The Father's promise given. Spread the tidings round. Wherever people are found. Tell them the comforter has come. Not for a task. Not for a time. Not for a place, a person, a period, a purpose poured out without measure. Not to just fall on us, but to live inside of us. Would you thank God for the Holy Ghost? <laughs> okay, let me get to point one because y'all y'all bored. So what does that mean? Relevant question. Dr. Samuel D. Witt Proctor, Lori, always said, your pastor, my brother, who was, I think, I won't, uh, well, I can say it, uh, Doc's favorite student, Doc Booth, I think, was Dr. Proctor's favorite student. Uh, Dr. Proctor always said, you heard me say it enough, uh, that every sermon ought to have a relevant question. Re the relevant question I want to raise is, um, if the Holy Spirit has come Pentecost Sunday, what does that mean and what does that look like? And there are three manifestations and I'll let you go wherever you're going. Here's the first thing. The first thing I want us to lift is what I'm calling the difference. Everyone say the difference. That the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost makes in the life of the Christian. Now, now, DP, remember, I mentioned to you a few moments ago that prior to Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon people for a period, a purpose, in a place, but it was always select persons or person. But with the coming of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out on every believer, every child of God, and every Christian, listen to me, every Christian now has the right and the privilege to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Pastor Kelly, I am, I can't call the names because I would never embarrass this preacher. But in our town, you know, there was H. Kelly Temple where you grew up, 
First Church of God, where I grew up, First Baptist, and then Bethel A&M. One of those churches, I was talking to a son of that church on the phone one day, and I asked him about another son of that church and how he was faring. He said to me, he said, oh, he's doing great. He said, you know, he's some preacher. I said, he sure is, always has been. And then he said to me, innocently, I know it, as a compliment. He said, now nah, he got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I knew what he meant, because he, you know, he's a, he was a hooper. <laughs> he, could, he would tear a house up. And, and, and he said, he got the Holy Ghost. And I knew, he, I knew he was trying to compliment him, but I thought to myself, oh, pity him. To think that a style of preaching represents the Holy Ghost. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. And that only certain preachers can have him. I'm preaching right now. I've got good news for everybody in the room online. If you are saved, you are a candidate for the baptism, the infilling, and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And you don't have to be a preacher, prophet, apostle, or pastor. I wish I had a church could celebrate that. A.W. Tozer, the late A.W. Tozer said, to have the Holy Spirit in our lives is to have another person living inside of us. God, I thank you. For the believer, the Holy Spirit is the difference that makes all the difference. Here's why. Because he lives in us. Stay with me. The person of the Holy Spirit. The person. <sighs> Stop asking folk about the Holy Ghost. Do you have it? That's like COVID. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. Are you in the room with me? This is why we miss him, because we're looking for an it. Okay, now I'm gonna really get in trouble, but it's all right, you can't fire me, I've been here too long. Here it is, here it is, here it is, because too many believers settle for it instead of him. They settle for some feeling, some emotion, some ecstatic experience. That ain't bad, but that ain't all. Oh, Jesus, God, help me here. Did I just say something? Did I just say something, Bill? Here it is. Listen, an experience is not bad. An ecstatic encounter is not bad. That ain't bad, but that ain't all. Because in life, when I'm going through, I need more than just a feeling. I need more than just an urge. I need more than just an emotion. I need somebody. Oh, person, the person of the Holy Spirit. What does that look? I have 15 minutes. Here it is. A, it means he's alive in us. Oh, he's alive. I want to say this to some of y'all been sitting here, some of our guests, you may not belong to a church like First Church. You may belong to a church that's a little more quiet, a little more sedate, a little more refined than us. Don't get scared. We ain't going to do nothing to you. But the Holy Ghost in us is alive. And anything alive shows some sign. He's active in us. He's not just alive in us. He, he's active in us. He's working in us. Now, now that working ain't just, is not just making you shout. Sometimes it's sitting you down. I'm so tired of y'all and your version of the Holy Ghost that only makes you speak in tongues and shout, but doesn't make you pay tithe or treat folk right. I just don't, I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it. Michelle, I don't get it, but Roy, I don't get it. I don't get it, I don't know what kind of Holy Ghost that is. Let you cuss folk out, tell folk off, and still you got a prophecy. I don't want you telling me nothing. 
He's alive. Everybody say, he's alive in us. He is active in us. Here's the shout for me when I was working on this sermon, and he's abiding with us. Oh, God, I thank you. Pity a believer that only has the Holy Ghost on Sunday in the sanctuary. I need them on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday and on Friday and sure enough on Saturday night. He abides with me, gives me victory. God never fails. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. So there's, everyone say the difference. There's the difference he makes in the church. Let me, in the Christians. Secondly, there's the difference he makes in the church. The Holy Spirit, Deacon Croft, is the presence of God in and among his people. When the people of God gathered, first church, hear me today, online in the room, Erica, praying for you and the family. I'm going to talk about y'all in just a minute. When the people of God gather, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is among them. His presence makes all the difference. Oh boy. Let me go for a walk. Let me go for a walk. Let me take a walk. See, y'all are spoiled. Okay, let me, let, let me say it. Gary, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. Y'all are spoiled. I love you, but y'all spoiled. And it's all right, because I spoiled you. So like me talking about pugging little lady, or Dee Dee and Jocelyn, they, they spoiled. I can't say too much. We spoiled them. <laughs> Pug no little lady here, so I can tell it. They spoiled. They got us wrapped around their finger. We put up a good bluff, though. <laughs> well, don't, don't be thinking we don't be, you know, at the house talking big. I spoiled y'all. Y'all, we spent a lot of money on sound and lights and cameras and paying musicians, worship ministers. We spent a lot of money on that. Y'all come in here and if a song is not something you like, you got the nerd to get mad. 52 Sundays, they sing one song you don't like and you ready to go join another church. All this money we spend. See, y'all should have came up when I came up. We didn't have, we, the church I grew up in had carpet down the middle aisle and in the front, but under the pews it was bare wood floor. And if Aunt Betty wasn't there or Sister Evelyn wasn't there, we had to make music and melody with our heart, our mouths, and our feet. Y'all ain't helping me here. And all we had in our church was a piano and an organ. A Hammond B3, that's all we had. We didn't have no band, wasn't no band. Dad wasn't gonna have no band. You had bands in a nightclub. We had no band, we had no band. But we had church, Jimmy O. Because when the saints got together, we brought with us the Holy Ghost in us. And we didn't need all this other stuff. We could sing a cappella. Child, you ain't never heard singing till Mother Eddins got to singing over in that corner. Child, you ain't never heard it till them deacons at First Baptist doing the devotional, singing a charge to keep our hand. You ain't never heard singing until you came to First Church of God and we started singing page nine. Once again, we come and we didn't have all this other stuff, but when the saints got together, I wish I had a witness up in here. And sometimes I think we ought to sit everybody down and we just ought to ask the Holy Ghost, sweep on in here and fill us again with your presence in our midst. We can't do it because y'all too busy waiting on Gabby. Waiting on Sylvia. 
waiting on this one and that. They are not here to worship for you. They are here to worship with you. Tell somebody, say, he preaching real good now. Thank you, Vaughn. No, no. When, when, when the people of God gather, Holy Spirit shows up. That presence makes all the difference in the world. What's the difference the Holy Spirit makes in the church? Glad you asked. A, it's to grow his church. The Holy Ghost grows the church. Y'all give me all this credit. Child, you've been here all these years and thousands have joined this church. They ain't joined the church because I grew it. Y'all say amen. Don't be scared. I'm saying it. Did God use me? Yes. But growth comes by the Holy Spirit. It's right there in verse 41. He added to the church every day. Come on. Verse 41 tells us souls were added and then multiplied. They went from addition to multiplication because the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church grows the church. It's also gifting the church. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. You know the story. Peter and John going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. There's a lame man there at the gate and uh, asking for money. And they say, look on us. Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give we unto you in the name of Jesus. Oh, only the vice chairman knows it. Rise up, walk, and immediately. His ankle bones received strength, and he stood up, leaping and praising God. The Holy Spirit doesn't just grow the church, he gifts the church. In, in, in Acts 3, 1 through 9, it's gifts of faith and gifts of healing and word of knowledge. The gifts. And then the Holy Spirit present in the church makes the difference because he's there to guard the church. Yeah. Acts chapter 5, 9 through 11, Acts 12 uh, uh, through 13, uh, you'll notice, you'll notice that uh, Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Ghost. God wipes them out. And the Bible says, and great fear came upon the whole church. It says that after that, nobody just joined them casually because they saw the reality of the Holy Ghost. Why y'all getting quiet? Now, now the Holy Spirit grows the church, Deacon Angie, and the Holy Spirit gifts the church, but I want y'all to know, and here's as a pastor where I thank God and the Holy Ghost guards the church. Okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. Uh, Sister Kelly, I'm going to try it, First Lady. I'm going to try it. That's why some things have never happened in this church, not because folk didn't want to try it, but because the Holy Ghost is guarding it. Okay, y'all ain't helping me. Y'all ain't. I wish I had somebody up in here who could shout with me that across the years of your life, the Holy Ghost has guarded you and the Holy Ghost has covered you and the Holy Ghost has protected you. Listen, the only reason you didn't die. Okay, what, Bill, am I talking good? Only reason you didn't die on Monday in that car crash is because the Holy Ghost guards us and the Holy Ghost protects us. Do I have anybody else here who was in? an accident was sick enough to die but God raised you up because the Holy Ghost guards his church everybody holler the difference the difference difference he makes in the Christian the difference he makes in the in the church I have five minutes here it is and then it's the difference he makes in the culture the Holy Spirit in the Christian is the person of the Holy Spirit or the person of God abiding in that believer. The Holy Spirit in the church is the presence of God filling his church. But the Holy Spirit in the culture is the power of God on display in the world. In John 16, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment in verse 8. The Holy Spirit in the culture, in the world, convicts 
convinces and converts the world and brings them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He does that in three ways, and I close. A, by witnessing to the world. If you go back and look at Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 13, you will be amazed, I promise you will, at the list of nations, tongues, nationalities that are there on the day of Pentecost. God, I feel like preaching this, Ram. Here it is, here it is. The world is there. Dwellers of Mesopotamia, Pontus, Phygeria, Cappadocia, Places, regions beyond Africa, Asia, what we would now call Europe. They are there. The world is in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Y'all still didn't get it because you're sitting there. The world is there. And when the Holy Ghost falls, the world hears the good news in their own tongue. Uncle George, I wish they'd help me preach this. See, 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 some of y'all get scared of the Holy Ghost and scared of tongues because you think, oh God, oh God, I, I don't know about that. Listen, first of all, tongues in Acts 2 are not the tongues in 1 Corinthians. The tongues in Acts 2 are historical languages. The tongues in 1 Corinthians is what Paul calls a heavenly language. Y'all are missing this. Y'all are missing this. So watch this. When the Holy Ghost fell and the world is there from Pontus and Phygeria and Cappadocia, from regions of Libya and Cyrene, and they all hear them speak the wonderful works of God. Here it is in their tongue. Everybody heard the gospel in their language. Okay, y'all still ain't with me. Y'all, I don't know why y'all work make me work so hard. I've been here 41 years. Don't I get some time off for good behavior? Come on, y'all. They heard the word in their own tongue, in their own language, and that's what the Holy Ghost wants us to do. He wants to take the message of salvation and redemption and pardon and forgiveness and tell the world what Christ can do for them. And we have to learn, Deacon Ross, how to speak in their language. We got to learn how to be conversant in the language of the culture. We don't change the message, but we create a language by which the message is heard in their ear in their own language. Used to be a time when uh, the black church did not do nothing but preach black. It wasn't about there but black folk. Now we preach to the world. So even my illustrations cannot just be black illustrations. Boy, y'all getting quiet. I, I can't just talk about Martin Luther King. I got to talk about Abraham Lincoln. I can't just talk about Rosa Parks. I got to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt. Why are y'all getting so quiet? I can't just talk about Adam Clayton Powell. I also got to talk about Jacob Javits and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I've got to learn how to use illustration that help people who are sitting here who don't speak the tongue I grew up in. Somebody say he's preaching real good right there. It's by, by working, by, by witnessing in the world. Then it's by working in the world. I told you Acts chapter 3, Lee Hinton, watch this, Acts chapter 3, they're going to church. Everybody say they're going to church. Going to church. They're going to church. Got one minute. They're going to church, and there's a lame man there. And, and thank God, they ain't, they ain't so busy going to church that they walk by the, the lame man. Because the Holy Spirit uses us to touch hurting people. Okay, I'm not getting any help. Let me try it again. No, no. See, you have the Holy Ghost in your life. He will open your eyes to see the hurt and the pain of the people around you and then allow you to be a blessing to them so that they are convinced of the reality of God because you took time to touch them. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, show somebody they're traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. 
He sends us out to touch the world, to touch the hurting. And then he does it not only by witnessing to the world and working in the world, he does it by winning the world. Yeah. Acts chapter 2, 47 says, praising God. Whew, I love this. Having favor with all the people. Y'all missed that. Praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. I'm going to close on this and I'm going to leave it alone. If you think the only time God can save somebody is Sunday morning, we in a world of trouble. <laughs> if you think the only way folk can get saved is you drag them by here by the nap of their neck and they sit here and listen to me preach, we're not going to get a harvest. But you got to make up your mind you too are an ambassador. God, I wish I had help here. Somebody just tell a neighbor, so you're an ambassador. You're a minister. You're an agent. And you don't have to drag them here to get saved, but you ought to invite them to come after they get saved because you can witness to them on a coat of bus. Oh, God, I'm through, Deacon Dowdy. Y'all ain't going to help me. You can witness to them in a classroom at The Ohio State University. You can witness to them in a dorm room at Ohio University, at Wilberforce. You can witness to them at Central State in the cafeteria. You can witness to them in the, in the is Rhodes Tower still open? In Rhodes Tower on the elevator because wherever you are, Wherever God places you is where you ought to let God use you to touch somebody's life. Would you turn, turn to one of your neighbors and say, neighbor, don't wait to get to church on Sunday to pray for somebody to get saved. But when you wake up every morning, say, Lord, if I go to the dealership to get my car worked on, and I'm sitting in the room waiting on my car and somebody's in there, would you give me the courage to say a word about Jesus? If I'm at the doctor's office and the doctor's later, rather than fussing and cussing, would you give me somebody that I can say a word about Jesus? If I'm standing in the express line at the supermarket and somebody got 30 pieces instead of 12 or 15, don't let me go ballistic but help me use that time to tell somebody about Jesus is there anybody here who can shout with me I didn't get saved on a Sunday I didn't get saved in church but right where I was when I called on his name he saved me he washed me is there anybody here who can thank God He'll save you on a Monday. He'll save you on a Tuesday. He'll save you on a Wednesday. He'll save you on a Thursday. He'll save you on a Friday. He'll save you on a Saturday. And God knows he'll save you on a Sunday. Would you turn, turn, turn to one of your neighbors? Say, neighbor, I don't know what day you got saved, but I'm so glad he picked me up Turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. Is there anybody here who can shout with me on Pentecost Sunday because he's real? Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I've had a long week. I ain't going to do that. He's real. Christ Jesus, real today. He walks with me. He talks with me. A long life's narrow way. He's real. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it, Winston. Don't do it. He's real. Salvation to impart. You ask me how. I know he's real. He's real.